any fundraising plan or strategy, and any work that you do in the nonprofit field requires looking at sustainability. Um, how many of you are concerned about the sustainability of your organizations? Everybody. Okay. It's a big issue. Okay. Um, in, um, in the case of Bolivia, when I put together um, a debt swap, um, it helped set up a sustainability fund for 34 NGOs. And that fund still exists today after 15 years. And it, it, it's a network called Procosi, and it became a model of how money from USAID was able to uh, set up a sustainability fund. Now, when you were at USAID, did you ever do any debt swaps in any of the countries you were involved in? I was involved in endowments, but not personally in debt swaps, although no colleagues that were involved in debt swaps. Okay. Well, the debt swap that I put together in Bolivia was with USAID money. And, um, and debt swap is part of what is one of the lines that could at some point work in Mongolia. I've gotten some information about uh, Mongolian debt. A lot of it is government debt. Um, I have not, um, and from what I can see, the U.S. has not uh, owed much or any money, from what I understand, right? Um, in terms of bilateral debt. Uh, I mean, I've had conversations on that. I haven't been directly involved, but I don't think that that's part of what they do right yeah. now. But the debt swap is one model for sustainability, and I'm now working on a debt swap for Dominican Republic and possibly Panama. Um, and the idea is to set up funds that will allow for the sustainability of programs. You know? So I break down sustainability, one, in the economic. One thing is that sustainability is the capacity to be able to cover expenses and so on for the institution. Economic sustainability is important because you want to cover your overheads, you want to cover all your administrative expenses, and so on. But Economic sustainability is not the only issue in sustainability that one has to look at. To me, it's also important programmatic sustainability. How do you plan on sustaining your programs in the long term? Who are the key stakeholders? Because if you're not relevant in the projects that you're working on, you can't be sustainable. So programmatic is extremely important. The social. What is the community support the organization can count on? What happens if you're working in a community and you don't have the support of the community? You can't be sustainable. You can't go after funding if you're not being relevant you know, and having an impact once again. You know? So, um, and back to the role of the directors. The board of directors plays a critical role in the sustainability of the organization. Um, and it's important that they be aware of these issues and, and help and deal with issues of sustainability. It also involves establishing new models of strategic partnership with the private sector, social organizations, communities, and donors. It's changing the paradigm of what development is. Ten years ago, um, public-private partnerships really weren't that common. <clears throat> Sustainability was not as big of an issue. It also involves being open to new ideas. Once again, we're talking about innovation. You are more likely to be sustainable if you are innovative. It includes maintaining a spirit of innovation. It also includes strong leadership and management. And by strong leadership, I mean having um, an executive director that he or she um, have the leadership skills that are required, the administrative skills, the capacity to work as a team, the capacity to delegate, and you have to have a strong management structure. A lot of organizations fall apart because they do not have a strong management component. 
And I've seen many NGOs shut down because of issues with management. And not just with money disappearing, um, but also because the ma management capacity is not there. So that's also a very, very important issue. Uh, in the case of this one organization where the president was using foundation resources for personal benefit, eventually the foundation was shut down because the actions that were done by this person that were in detriment of the foundation. You know? So one has to be very, very careful about the management part and how that can affect the sustainability of an organization. So, continuing on the role of the board of directors. They provide the strategic direction, mission, and vision for your organization. They should be part of the innovation process. They should help with identifying and contacting donors. That is extremely important. You can't expect a board of directors to get involved in fundraising if they're not involved in the mission and the vision of your organization. But they're not the ones necessarily, unless you're a small organization and you have that level of support, normally a board of directors is, is not, a member of the board is not going to write the proposals. That rarely happens. I was a rare case where I was doing proposals and going after money um, as president of a, of a board, but then I had a team that was implementing the projects. Um, but board directors should be chosen, one, because of their commitment to what you're doing. Second, that they have the contacts and relationships that can help with the sustainability of the organization. And that means picking up the phone and talking to a banker or talking to an executive or a government official and being able to connect to those people. So for me, having a strong board is extremely important in the resource mobilization process. If you don't have a strong board, you're going to have issues. So cultivating relationships is, is key part of this. Help plan and organize events. Yeah. What events, I hear somebody that you had a, a marathon here, a 10 kilometer <coughs> marathon and what other events do you as nonprofits do to raise money? Can I get some examples of things that you do? Dinner events. Pardon? Dinner events. What type of dinner events? Um, you just post a place where you invite people and have them and then use that money for revenue donation. For fundraising. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I work with the YMC. We don't have this money on June second. Okay. At the National Park, and we invited a lot of organizations, and I think that's a good way to work in. And so you use that as a fundraising tool, but also to get them involved. Yeah, not necessarily fundraising, but networking and okay. let them know more about YMCA on yeah. YouTube. Yeah, that's a good. It's networking is extremely important in resource mobilization, even though you might not make money out of a dinner, you're bringing people in who, could, who are then supporters and eventually could do donate money. And one thing I want to be clear, when I talk about resource mobilization, I prefer that word to fundraising because building the resources that you need in an organization are not necessarily money. Okay? It also involves having the people that will support you. It's having the volunteers. It's having the door openers who can identify people who can support you. So dinners are extremely important. The marathons are extremely important. What other events do you all do to help raise money? Or you don't do many events? Art exhibitions. Pardon? Art exhibitions. And your organization works in that? Yeah. We and find like a high um, art programs that we organize that to support the young artists and sell their uh, artists and account gives them part of the money for them and start like having inviting some other funders and stakeholders for the party. Yeah, that's great. And in the States there are organizations that do car washes, they do marathons, they do dinners, they do ga uh, galas. There are a lot of different events that are being done. Silent auctions is another way mm -hmm. to raise money. Uh, raffles is another way. And in all those cases, the board plays a role, 
but you who are in a management position have to examine what is the cost benefit of each event that you are involved in. Because you don't want to spend a lot of the time, both money, time and resources for an event that might not bring any return. And when I talk about return, I'm looking at financial, but also networking. So the board will they'll open all doors to companies, foundations, and government officials. They play a key role in the sustainability of your organization. And they can make donations. What's also extremely important in resource mobilization is organizing a committee. If you don't have one, I suggest you do it. If that is useful for what you need at the stage that you are in as an organization. It involves members of the board of directors and volunteers in fundraising efforts. The committee should include members of the board, members of the executive staff, and outside volunteers that can help you. It helps the development team keep board members involved and helps to recognize supporters and donors. Now, helping recognize supporters and donors is also an important part of resource mobilization. In some cases, if a person has donated money for a school, that person might want to have his or her name on that school. Okay. Or they donate a, a clinic. Some people don't care. In the United States, there are people who donate because they want to be recognized. Other people don't. It really depends on who the donor is. A, a mining company might want to have a, a plaque or a press release saying that they donated to such a cause because they're interested in getting good publicity. So donor recognition is an important part of fundraising. And one of the issues when I was working in Egypt was there was not a donor policy. And I put one together. And you wonder, why do you need a donor policy? For smaller organizations, it doesn't make sense. But as you grow, it does. You know, and um, to use an example, there was a company that makes beer and they wanted to sponsor a hall and they wanted the name of that beer company. Well, in Egypt people drink a lot even though it's a Muslim country um, and they make beer there and they make wine. But publicly the law did not allow for any official recognition of a, you can't have ads of any alcohol in Egypt. So you could not get asked for a donation from a beer company uh, because you couldn't recognize it. Um, what happens if you, um, your organization is approached by a tobacco company and you're working in health and children? Would you accept money from a tobacco company? I, I don't think any of us will, right? What will you do with an alcohol company? You know, what do you do with companies that you're not sure exactly where their money is from? And there are a lot of scandals in the United States and elsewhere where there's donations made to organizations that are non-for-profit where the origins of the funds. And in the United States it's gotten even more worse because you can now donate for political parties for, to support a candidate and you don't have to identify where the money is coming from. So the policy has to be very, very clear of what is allowed and what isn't. Now, what is what happens if one of your donors, sorry if I'm moving at the camera, I should be <laughs> staying foot like that so that I they can <laughs> record me, but I'm, I'm not used to staying in one place. Um, but what happens if you receive money from somebody who wants to be a political candidate and wants to use that NGO to project himself or herself politically? Would you accept money from that person? But organizations do. And sometimes political leaders establish foundations. And you have, I've seen in a couple countries where first ladies establish foundations to support their causes. And some do great work, others use it for political reasons. Uh, so one has to be very, very careful about how you're managing donations and that there be a policy of what is acceptable or not. And I'm sure in the case of World Vision, 
you have a clear, I'm sure you have a policy at an international level, you will not accept money from uh, an arms, a company that deals with weapons, for example, uh, or a company that's in the production of alcohol or cigarettes, correct? Right. That's clearly spelled out. But it's good to have that because you don't want to be in a situation where a donor comes um, and says, I want to give you $100,000, but in return, I want this or that. Or I want my daughter to be running this organization, but on the condition that I give you the money. So you have to be very, very careful on, on this issue. <clears throat> the role and importance of volunteers. We talked a little bit about it. It helps involve them in the community at work. They can bring in new ideas. They can help raise resources. A lot of the fundraising efforts for non-for-profits are carried out by volunteers. And this could be student volunteers, it could be interns, it could also be retirees. You know. mm -hmm. It is, there are several organizations worldwide that work with retirees, that send them overseas to help work with nonprofits. And I've worked with several of these organizations, and they provide some f f fabulous people to work with. Uh, so if you don't have a program to involve volunteers, my recommendation is get one going. And if you're looking at college students, work out agreements with universities so that they get recognition for it. Uh, if they're professionals, see if they can do it as part of their work. Negotiate with companies that they can, employees can earmark part of their time to work with you. That is extremely important because you're also getting human resources to cover needs that you as an organization cannot afford. So they can help to reduce the cost of administration and personnel in your institution. I've also met organizations that are fully dependent on, on volunteers, which is fine, depending on what you're doing. I'm a member of the Rotary Club. We're all volunteers. I'm in charge of the, of the small charities programs. We don't have an overhead. All the money we get goes in. We don't have, handle big amounts of funds, but Rotary is, a, Rotary is a volunteer organization except it does have paid staff at the national and regional level. So it's fine that it be an all-volunteer organization. But one has to be clear, too, of the roles and responsibilities. And more than ever, be sure that the money is handled transparently. And when I talk about students having in internships. And any, any questions? Yes. So I think, at least for me, one of the concerns with volunteers, um, and this is probably more applicable to previous roles, but um, how do you manage things like accountability and intellectual property? And because you know, they're not technically a, an employee, but I mean, do you have them sign a contract? Or yes, yeah. that's that's a very important question. Depends on if you are a three-person organization and the volunteer is. Depends on what the role of the volunteer and the institution. But if you are an organization that has a volunteer program, you want to make sure that one, there is an agreement that spells out what he or she are responsible for and not responsible for. You do not want a volunteer signing the checks for your organization because that level of authority should come from somebody who is paid. You also have to be aware of liabilities. What happened if a volunteer is working on a construction site building homes and has an accident? Who is responsible? Um, if you are an organization and the person has a broken leg, you are liable. And that has legal repercussions. So you might want to have an insurance policy covering volunteers. There are also cases of you have a volunteer who does improper acts, um, whether economic or sexual molestation or whatever, you also want to make sure that the person who's volunteer, first of all, has a clean record. And that that person then is, it's clear what are the liabilities. If somebody does something that is not correct or might be, have legal repercussions, you want to make sure that you're covered 
the victims more than anybody else is covered, and, and that that person is held accountable. So it is a delicate issue with volunteers, but it's also the same, you have the same issues with others in the organization. Um, you just want to make sure that it's all spelled out. And if volunteer, you're offering to pay the volunteer their housing, and the person is there one month, and then you say, well, I'm sorry, I don't have the money to pay the housing. No, that creates, you know, your, your reputation is at stake. But at the same time, if the volunteer is coming from another country, and you've told them you can't pay anything, and then a month later they say, well, now you have to reimburse me for my travel, when that, that was never agreed upon. So it's good to spell it out. Okay. And when I was in working in Bolivia and working in, in when I had a English bank, uh, English uh, newspaper, all my journalists were volunteers because I could not afford to pay an English. Well, I had two that were not the editor, but the others came from Australia, from New Zealand, from England, from the United States because it was so hard to get a job as a journalist that they were excited to have the opportunity to volunteer at a newspaper and build up a resume. And that is a, one of the reasons that volunteers want to work with your organizations is they're building up a resume. And one of the key things that you as leaders of your organization is if some volunteer, and I get them almost every week, somebody who's worked with me sometimes years ago, say, please give me a recommendation because I'm applying for another job or I want to go to graduate school. To me, it's priority number one to respond and send a letter. Because they will, one, appreciate it, and secondly, they deserve it. Because they are giving their time, their energy, their spirit, because they also want something in return. And that is experience. It's helping them open doors. So I have usually a, a standard letter that I have my files, I adapt it to each situation. But if somebody asks you for a recommendation, that person has done a great job, do it as soon as you can. Because that will also spread the word that you are a serious organization in dealing with volunteers. But I, I probably wouldn't have been able to do half of what I do without volunteer support. It's absolutely critical. In terms of the donor circles, um, one is personnel in your institution. In some institutions, donors play an important role, especially in foundations, um, our family-owned foundations. Uh, the next level are the board members and, and volunteers. Families and friends are also extremely important. Network of individuals and institutions and individuals with shared interests and then the general public. And here I want to emphasize the word of network. Part of the work that is needed to be done in resource mobilization is networking. How many of you are members of a network of NGOs of one sector or another? A few. Now, is there a national organization where all of you are sort of members and um, Network together, there is in Mongolia. This is a Mongolian international organization. Just the international NGOs, yeah. but for national NGOs, do you have an organization that represents you. Yes. National government NGO. I'm sorry, Richard. National government NGO. Is it a network of NGOs? Yeah. Now, do you, those who work in the health sector, do you have one that works in the health sector per se? No. There's a very informal one for the international NGOs. Informal one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Networking is extremely important not only in the fundraising resource mobilization, but also as an organization. I was in Panama two weeks ago giving a similar workshop. And <clears throat> that was a two day workshop, and we had uh, work tables and people sat down and um, worked on uh, uh, developing strategic plans and SWATs and there were people working in similar areas and were meeting for the first time around the table and they work in the same country in the same city and they did not know what the other ones were doing 
And networking is extremely important because you'd just be surprised to find the commonality of interest that exists between your organization and others. And if you think that you can operate your organization as a silo, you are wrong. You need to reach out to others because one, it allows the opportunity for partnerships. You know, it allows to join efforts. And there are some grants that require two or three organizations to come together. And what I've also found is that newer NGOs that don't have the financial or work uh, experience to qualify for a grant can join efforts with another NGO that does and you can become a subcontractor or a partner and you can then qualify for funding. And that's why it's important to have networks. So to me, I have learned a lot from other organizations. There's obviously information like who are your donors, you don't want to share that. But I think there are a lot of common interests and concerns that you can share with other organizations that are doing similar work. And I think coming together as, as uh, NGOs and sharing experiences, I think is extremely useful in, in what we're talking about. So, go over briefly what is the fundraising process. We shall summarize some of what we talked about. Keep abreast of the processes and tools used in fundraising. Invest in the training of personnel involved in fundraising. One of the organizations, are any of you members of the Association of Fundraising Professionals? Have you heard of that at all? It's a US-based organization that works internationally. The, uh, the name is AFPNET. Uh, and in, in the resources at the end, you'll see their, the link. But I highly recommend that the organizations that are seriously involved in resource mobilization that you join. They have a conference every year, about 4,000 people go and they go from all over the world. And if you can somehow get your organization or somebody to cover your travel there, it is highly recommended. They have uh, hundreds of workshops on resource mobilization. And you will come learning about things that you never imagined. And we're only covering, scratching the surface of resource mobilization. For example, there are programs on plant giving, Anybody hear about plan giving, what that is? I'm sure you have. Plan giving is one of the important sources of revenues for the US. And what it is, is that somebody leaves it in their will that when they pass away, their shares, their property, their money will go to a particular organization. And people leave a hell of a lot of money in the United States. That's a, it has generated tens of billions of dollars through planned giving. So there are workshops on planned giving. It might not be appropriate for Mongolia. There are also courses on um, use of information technology, on donor management systems that we're covering. Also capital campaigns. Have you heard of the word capital campaigns? You want to build a school it's going to cost you $100,000 and do a capital campaign to raise money. Or you do a capital campaign to establish an endowment. It's a more focused campaign for something specific. And this AF, Association of Fundraising Professionals, gives all kinds of workshops on this. So if you can, I highly recommend you go there. And so that, that is part of what is involved in training. And the amount of information on the web is incredible. And I mentioned already New York University. They have a philanthropy program and they have a certificate for fundraising professionals. And it's all, all done online. Be aware of donors and organizations that work in your field. Join organizations that work in your field. And member, being 
uh, members of these organizations is critical. Uh, DevEx, uh, have any of you heard of DevEx? They're, they have a, quite a bit of really useful information. They also have uh, job openings, uh, consultancies, but they also give you a good idea of trends that are taking place in the development world. It's devx.org. You'll, you'll see the link in the resources I list at the end. But I check them every single day. And they will say what is happening with DFID, British Cooperation. What is the new direction of USAID? What is happening with Australian aid? No. Because then it keeps you abreast of what is what funders are doing and what donors are doing. And there was an interview recently with the new USAID director. No. There's talk that USAID might merge with State Department. Well, how many of you get funding from USAID? One. World Vision does work with the USAID, you know? You do do. Well, a lot of the programs are continuing, but some may not. So it also keeps abreast of what is happening in the development world. And DevEx is one of them. Development aid is another. Okay. Um, and so uh, um, it's important that the, that the management and the team working in development and management as a whole be aware of this. And I spend every day, I, I spend at least an hour reading up on what's happening in the developing world, what's happening in technology and trends and where things are going. And participating in fundraising conferences that I mentioned is what AFT does. No? Reiterate new search engines. Check out websites and publications about their work. Meet with friends of your organization, the board of directors and advisors, to identify sources of support. And that's where it's also important that you find informal settings that you're meeting with possible donors. If you think that just sending an email to a banker and saying, we want you to donate 50000 um, um, and hope that that will come through, that's not going to work. You have to establish the personal relationships that will facilitate. Now, there are requests for proposals that come out um, that you will never meet the person who's requesting the money, okay? And that happens all the time. The Asian Development Bank might have an R RFP for something, and you might not have a personal contact. But, and where you can, do it, you know? And it's, it's extremely useful in what you're doing. Also, map out funding sources. Who are your current funders and what amounts? What amounts are needed to cover current requirements? What are the deficits you must cover? How much can you expect from current donors? How diversified is your funding base? Do you have new funding sources to cover your deficit? And what new opportunities are you pursuing? Any questions? All clear? Yes. Time management. We've talked a bit of this about already, you know? But the key word here is have an elevator pitch ready. If you have five minutes to talk to a possible donor, what are you going to say in five minutes? You have to be focused and keep it short. What are the top things? And practice it. And a lot of the context you will have will only be minutes. And a pitch for a project too. And I'm I'm working on an investment pitch for my health project. They recommend that the slides not be more than 15. So you have to be able to tell your story in 15 slides or less. Can you do it? I tell you, it's not easy. I find it very difficult to do it. But the attention span of the time that can be devoted to a project is not very long. So keep it short. And use graphics as much as you can. That is becoming more and more the trend. They want things to be presented very to the point, graphically interesting. 
And investors will want to look at the commercial viability of a social business. The funding challenge has always loomed large over social entrepreneurs wanting to change the world. So when we're talking about resource mobilization, it's constant here, it's constant in Latin America. You're facing a lot of the same issues. A transformative step in the life of social enterprise is the leap from grant to investment capital. And we'll talk more about social businesses in a little while. The jump to debt or equity capital from investors willing to bet on a commercial viability of a social business model is typically an early and critical business test for growth. So a non-for-profit can set up a for-profit business. And there are for-profit businesses that are owned by non-profits. We'll talk more about that in the social business component. The difference is that the profits that are generated by the for-profit have to go into uh, social causes. You know? But a microcredit organization can be a for-profit and can be a non-for-profit. And a non-for-profit can be part of a microcredit organization. You know? But you have to be very careful country by country but what the legal implications are of this. So what does talked about pitches, what is the difference of how to pitch it. One of the things that we'll ask is how possible is it to scale up what you're doing? If you're serving a hundred kids a month and they want you to scale up to a thousand, can you do it? If you're providing services to, uh, um, uh, um, uh, to expectant mothers and they want you to cover a larger areas of donors, are you able to do it? What is your capacity to scale up? Telling a story is once again very important. Scale matters. There's some organizations that will not look at you if you're asking uh, for a thousand dollars when they won't give anything less than fifty thousand. There are other organizations that will only give a thousand dollars. You know, and if you're a small organization, a thousand can go a long ways. So it's important to identify the scale of what you're looking at. Investors and donors are drawn to scale. Ensure that your business model has a compelling story around scale. To tap into impact investment funds, you need to show that you can scale up and have an impact. Scalability of a model is driven in part by the demographics of the market. And once again, the importance of staying true to what you are as an organization. Now, one of the new trends in, that also involves scale are called donor advice funds. We were talking about that briefly in the United States. <clears throat> They're handling tens of billions of dollars in the United States now. They're called donor advised funds. And I suggest you navigate because some of those donor advised funds could come to projects here, especially if there's an international link. And I know there are a lot of international organizations who are based here. But what this means is that traditionally in the United States, a organization, um, a person made a lot of money in the IT sector and would set up a foundation, would set up a board of directors and donate money. That's what Bill and Melinda Gates did. You know? That's what uh, Zuckerberg of Facebook is doing. And when you have large amounts of money, it makes sense. But what if you have a million dollars that you want to donate? And to get yourself established your foundation, you need reporting, you need to get your stack, tax exempt status, you need to set up a board of directors. It's not worth it. So what has happened in the last few years is that individuals donate their money to a donor-advised fund. And some of the largest are community foundations. In Silicon Valley, they're handling billions of dollars. And there, there's the Schwab Charitable Fund and Vanguard Charitable Fund and they handle over $30 billion. Now that could be interesting when you have foreign mining companies 
or that have U.S. connections because they, members of those companies, might have set up donor advice funds. The advantage for them is that they give the money to the, advi the donor advice fund and they get the tax write-off immediately. So they don't have to wait until the money is dispersed two years, three years down the road. But they decide where that money goes. So if you have a worthy organization and are known by them, you're in a better position to receive the money. And in the US, that's become an important source of revenue for organizations. And you're looking at tens of billions of dollars that are now being channeled through donor advice funds. Because here, we often assume that it's, you go after USAID and British Cooperation and JICA, and then you assume that the corporate responsibility. But there's this whole new sector that is developing of funding options that it's not easy to get into because people have to know who you, they decide who the money's gonna to go to. They will not send a public notice and telling you we have this money. But I am sure that World Vision is well plugged into these types of funds and are accessing it. But it's an interesting mechanism to be at least aware of and see if there's any way that that can help with what you're doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, are they still responsible to choose who, whom they give money, or they this fund there are some also people in charge of this side? Well, the funds are dispersed by the fund because they own the money. The donor gave the money, got a tax write off to the fund. So, the legal owner of that money, manager of the money, because they don't really own it, is the donor advice fund. And they're the ones who then disperse it. But the one who donated the money recommends where the money should go to. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. But those who are looking at the donors, they should approach to the fund. Right? To the fund. Yeah. And it's not easy to get in opening those doors. Um, because then you have it's, yeah, because you don't often know who are the donors. And that's where personal relationships are critical. No? Um, yeah, we've covered a lot of these things already, so I won't go over the data. Relationship fundraising. Each of us is a vehicle for raising funds. You all have social capital. Fundraising is no longer just how to get money out of someone or how to make progress in making progress up the donor pyramid. It's how to inspire a donor to spread your story with passion. That way you're leveraging your social capital and your network of contacts and influence. That in turn opens opportunity for a range of funders and donors. In this connected world, you do not know who people know. This is important. You get somebody to donate. You build a school. A person comes, sees what you've done. They're excited about it. They'll tell their friends. They'll put things on their Facebook. And, and they'll say, my God, they did a wonderful job here. And I've heard of organizations here. There was a, 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 a movie star who came here, I understand, and visited a, a center and gave it a lot of publicity. And people donated money. You know, that type of publicity can be very useful. You have a case of... Um, um, an organization in India that was visited by the new Duchess of um, Duchess of York, is it? Uh, the new um, uh, Princess, uh, pardon? The Duchess of York, I think that's her, her official title now. Uh, and she visited this Indian NGO started by a 23 year old uh, um, lady. And she was at the wedding ceremony, and she's getting a lot of money now. They're expanding their work considerably because of a celebrity that went and visited their work. And that happens all the time. So if you have a way to connect with somebody, that's great. But you also have to be prepared to be able to assume the responsibility that that implies. Because there are organizations that have gotten a lot of publicity and gotten money, and they have not managed them well. And that word, if you're doing good things, it spreads. If you're doing things that are not doing well, it will also spread. 
you know. So the difference between transactional versus relationship fundraising. What donors want in the early stages of a relationship versus in the later stage. What data points are important to relationship fundraising and how technology can possibly influence relationships and when it can interfere. Relationship fundraising is basically anyone interested in you now matters. Relationship fundraising says you should assume all donors leave a legacy. They all want to be remembered in one way or another. You know, either because their name goes on something or because they feel good that they're leaving a legacy or they're doing something for others. And some don't want to be recognized. It doesn't mean being recognized. You know? The logic is that everyone is a channel including small donors which can lead to corporate partnerships, major grants, major gifts, new donors and legacy. Anyone who is interested in you or who you can engage to be interested in you now matters. And donors can attract other donors because of the experience we gave them, sometimes just as a result of a genuine thank you. That's where donor stewardship is critical. So you have established these contacts, you've built a network, your organization's doing well, you've got a good board of directors, and then you have a request for a proposal. So preparing a funding proposal also requires skill sets. And if you cannot do it, get people that can help you do it. How many of you know how to do a, law, a logical framework? You're an expert on it. I'm not an expert, but of course, it says USA is better than other, of course. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to show a template of a, a USAID logical framework. And any project with USAID and most US government projects require a logical framework. I think the same goes with the, the British cooperation and others. And um, so it's important how to do it. And there's a lot of information online. You know, and there are people who are experts on doing log frames, they call them. Um, so one is that you need to, to have the skill sets. You need to prove that you have a significant need or problem in your proposal. It has to deliver an answer to the need or solution to the problem based on experience, ability, logic, and imagination throughout your proposal. Make sure your proposal describes a program project for change. What makes it different? How does it stand out? Why is it innovative? Reflect planning, research, and vision throughout the proposal. Research grant makers, including funding purposes and priorities and applicant eligibility. And I, I prepared a proposal a couple of months ago to a, uh, called the Burke Global Fund. I read through all their terms and conditions, and, um, and I started a I prepared the document in Word, and then you to copy it into the proposal format. And then I started filling in the proposal, and it said, question number one, 1,200 characters. Question number two, 400 characters. Question number three, 1,200 characters. And nowhere in their terms of reference did it say how many characters. It just said the questions they wanted answered. And only when I started filling it all in did I realize that I was way over because 1,200 characters is less than 200 words. So I had to redo the proposal completely. It took me days to reduce a 20-page proposal to a five-page proposal. Now, it wasn't really my mistake because they weren't clear. And I checked through all their literature and couldn't find it. So donors also complicate things more than they should. But it's extremely important that you follow what they require. <clears throat> I sent a proposal last week um, that required a log frame and required a timeline. And if you don't have a log frame and you don't have a timeline, and if you're not registered, um, this was through grants.gov, and if you don't have your SAM number and your DUN number, um, you won't qualify. So make sure that when you're working on proposals, 
that you also have somebody else go over it and find things that you might be missing or might be wrong. Mm -hmm. Because if you think you can do it all by yourself and not have people edit and correct it, you're wrong. Working as a team is important. And even though I, I was a journalist for 15 years, I still have my materials uh, checked and, my, and edit because I miss things. So it's extremely important that you have the support team that will allow you to do proposals. You know? <coughs> and you also want to make sure that if they're asking funding for a project to support democracy strengthening in a country, you're not sending a proposal about how you want to clean up a river. You know, just to use a, a very simple example. Make sure that what you're applying for is what they are able to fund. And it is amazing the number of proposals that I have. When I ran the foundation in Washington, we received quantities of proposals that had nothing to do with what we, what, that we could fund. People don't read what are the terms of reference. Target grant makers appropriate to your field and project. Do not limit your funding requests to just one source. Contact the grant maker before you write your proposal to be sure you clearly understand the grant maker's guidelines. In some cases, you won't get any response. In the case of, I think, USAID and others, you usually there's an answer period that you can get, and you have time to ask questions. Make sure you ask the questions before. And then read the questions that others have asked, so that you know what are the issues. Mm -hmm. Present your proposal in the appropriate and concrete format, and include all required attachments. If they require your balance sheet, they require the CVs of your management team, make sure you've included it. State your organization's needs and objectives clearly and concisely. Write well. Do not waste words. <coughs> Use active rather than passive verbs. Very important. Use proper grammar and correct spelling. And if you're not a good writer yourself, work with somebody who can help you write it and who can edit. Make sure somebody else works. <coughs> Be clear, factual, supportable, and professional. A well-written proposal is a key factor in the grant maker's decision-making process. So if you expect to raise money through proposals and grants, you need to focus on that. And there are <coughs> courses on grant writing. There's a website that has a whole slew of programs. I think I describe it in the annexes. Um, uh, but I suggest if you don't have experience, take courses, and if not, work with people who can. You also want to spell out why you're seeking a grant, what you plan to do with the money, and why you are a good fit for the grant maker's priorities. Prepare an interesting, persuasive, and unique proposal. Always cover the following important criteria. Project purpose, feasibility, community need, funds needed, applicant accountability and competence. And you want to answer these questions. Who are you? How do you qualify? What do you want? What problem will you address and how? Who will benefit and how? What specific objectives will you accomplish and how? How will you measure the results? And how does your funding request comply with the grant maker's purpose, goals, and objectives? So every time you have a proposal, read through some of these things just to make sure that you're complying. But it is extremely important that you follow, you follow the guidelines that the grant maker is laying out. <coughs> so you want to demonstrate project logic and outcome, impact of funds, I reiterate the word impact again, and community support. Be specific about broad goals, measurable objectives, and quantified outcomes. Once again, using data to measure what you're doing. Always follow the exact specifications of the grant makers and their applications and the request for proposals and guidelines. And follow up with the grant maker about the status, evaluation, and outcome of your proposal after you submit it. And request feedback. Now, one of the organizations, I've worked with some projects with the European Union. 
And in the case of the European Union giving money to NGOs, they will give the money to a European NGO that could then partner with an NGO in a country like Mongolia. Do any of you have funding from European Union NGOs? You do. How, how long did it take you to get the proposal in and get the funding and so on? Almost a year. Huh? Almost a year. Almost a year. That's not uncommon. Once again, persistence. And how many partnerships did you need? You needed one or two? Two. Two here, right? And then in Europe, you needed one or two? One. one. That's, usually, that's pretty easy. Sometimes they need two there and then two here. But that's something you have to be aware of. That's where partnerships are critical. So you need to find the other organization you're going to apply with. And European Union funds always require going through a European NGO, which I gather you're doing. Like what country are you working with? What, from what country is the NGO that you're working with? In Mongolia? No, in, uh, in the European money. Where is it? Uh, UK. UK. Yeah, now things are going to change because they're not going to be part of the European Union. That's something you also need to see what's going to happen because what's going to happen because the UK is not going to be part, it's going to have an impact. Yeah. So that's why following organizations like DevEx is important. But I have found that one of the hardest funding sources to go after is the European Union because of all the partnership agreements that they require. Yeah. So what do you do after you receive funding? First, you thank and recognize. You inform on the advances of your programs. Present the reports that are required. <coughs> Make sure funds go to programs that are being financed. So what happens if an organization funds a water improvement project and you decide to build a road with the money? You're vol violating the terms of your contract. And I have seen organizations that get money for something and use it for something else. And that has legal implications and contractual obligations. So you want to make sure that you are abiding by the terms of your contract. Meet the goals that are agreed upon. And do not betray the trust of your donors. And that's where it's good that any contract that you have, review it with a lawyer and be very careful about counterparts because if you are agreeing to put in in-kind or cash contributions make sure you can do it and I have rejected grants there's some for example with the Inter-American Development Bank where they require 50 percent counterpart and 25 percent in cash and it's not easy to come up with those counterparts so if you have a million dollar proposal, you have to come up with 250,000 in cash and 250,000 in income. And I rejected one proposal because we didn't have that capacity. <coughs> so it also might mean that you don't want the money if it's gonna come with things that you cannot comply with. So should we take a break of um, 10 minutes and then I think we have another 20 slides to go afterwards? Okay. Stretch your legs a few minutes.